Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Kyle Rimkus. I'm going to get started. So if people want to sit down, I see people are still filtering in. But just to introduce myself. I am a librarian for digital programs and partnerships at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. If you want to follow along on my slides, I've uploaded them to our institutional repository, so the links are there. But I'd like to start by just remembering back to 2014 when Hadi Trust weathered their lawsuit brought against them by the, the Authors Guild, and uh, just the feeling of joy and pride that so many of us in this community felt and feeling that our professional values have been vindicated. And uh, one really interesting thing about that lawsuit was that the National Federation for the Blind had joined Hadi Trust as a co-defendant, which certainly had something to do with some of the wording that came out in the court finding to the effect of digitization with the goal of making works acceptable to the, accessible to the print disabled as protected under fair use. And I think that you know, made us feel even better about ourselves, look at all that we're doing for the blind, people with visual disabilities. Um, but, you know, how much had we actually done at that point? Hadi Trust does have a feature for people with registered print disabilities to go in and request access to PDFs. There are interesting things, uh, similar things in, there's a similar feature in Internet Archive. There are other people in this, people doing work in this space like Bookshare. So. There has been a lot of good work done in the repository space for this, but to my mind, that court finding was not so much an endorsement of work we had already done, um, so much as an endorsement of work that we had the potential to do and that we should do. And the project I'm going to be talking about today, I think, is taking a, an earnest step into that direction. So it's called Educational Materials Made Accessible, or EMMA. And it is a repository that is built to be used primarily by people who work in disability services offices at colleges and universities. So if you're in a position in one of these offices and you prepare texts for the needs of users with print disabilities via digitization and remediation, you can deposit them into the EMMA repository where they can be discovered by people from uh, working at other DSOs. DSO is kind of the, the acronym that we've been using for these disability service organizations. So, um, and that deposit we're envisioning will occur with, with the aid of librarians to ensure good metadata. EMMA is also a place that can serve as a single location to search across multiple, multiple repositories that house remediated texts. So Bookshare, Hadi Trust, Internet Archive, and the ACE portal. And if a DSO officer downloads something from Emma that comes from one of these repositories and further remediates it for a particular user's uh, special needs, that can be deposited back into Emma and as a variant version to the originating repository. So where do people with, uh, how do print disabled users acquire academic texts in the first place? Um, Angelina Zaitsev at Hadi Trust has created this graphic, which I think is really useful. So they have a number of options. It's not just a single place that they can go. They can purchase a text on the open market uh, via Kindle or as an audiobook through Audible, something like that. They can find a copy on an open access, open access website like Project Gutenberg. This is primarily texts that are in the public domain. They can borrow a text from their library. Uh, you know, good luck making sure that it's in the format that they need, but they can do that. They can sign up with a national service like Bookshare or the National Library Service for the, print, for the Blind and Print Disabled, or they can contact their campus disability services if they're on a university or college campus, and people who work there will try to procure accessible texts on their behalf by contacting publishers to try to get an accessible version by going through that How Do You Trust backdoor feature, um, or using this new service that is being rolled out. This quadrant down there is where we're really trying to make the most impact with this project. It has its roots in a white paper that came out of an IMLS research paper in 2017 called Libraries Take Aim. And this white paper issued a call to action to libraries to become more involved in this space. Um, it found that the challenges that DSOs face 
are very costly, that they're replicated across multiple universities, and that the skills that we have in libraries uh, can be useful here because a lot of the work being done involves digitization, metadata, um, file storage, things like that. There's also an awful lot of duplication of effort occurring in this space. Apparently, two-thirds of what gets uploaded by instructors into Blackboard is duplicative. Uh, so it stands to reason that uh, of, of all the texts that, that students are requesting, students with print disabilities, that there's going to be, there's a good chance that if they're requesting it from my university, they could be requesting it from yours as well, and that people in our DSOs are having to try and figure out how to make those texts accessible again and again. This IMLS grant was followed on by two rounds of implementation funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The grant was called FRAME, or Federating Repositories of Accessible Learning Materials for Higher Education. It was led out of the University of Virginia with John Unsworth as the PI. And the technology for this system is kind of an amalgam of uh, to kind of custom built things at the University of Virginia with uh, the software from the Bookshare platform. So Bookshare is the lead repository on this. They are focused on accessible materials. But Internet Archive, Hadi Trust, and the ACE portal also figure into this infrastructure. And there have been several uh, university library partners working on this as well. And in my own role at the University of Illinois, I've been active in both rounds of the grant, advising on metadata, testing out ingest tools as they're developed, and also trying to set up a workflow with our own uh, DSO on campus to try and advise on what that would look like for other universities who might join on as members. So at, at Illinois, we have a pretty robust digitization program. We digitize via Google Books. We have an Internet Archive scanning center in our library. We have our own digitization studio and work with vendors. We try to funnel as much as we can into Hadi Trust. That's kind of a, str a strategic decision that we've made. Now, several blocks away on campus is our Disability Resources and Educational Services Unit, or DRES. And they do digitization too, but if I may generalize, I would say that the digitization work they do, which is primarily with the goal of providing readers with texts they can use for, with screen readers, tends to be very different from what we do in libraries. So again, you know, generalizing, when it comes to urgency, we don't always have deadlines in libraries when it comes to our big digitization projects, but if a student is requesting a text from a DSO, it's generally because they need it now, they need it this coming semester, or best case scenario because it's on a reading list in the upcoming semester. When it comes to copyright, we librarians like to work through things that are in the public domain. But most of what's being requested in DSOs is, you know, it's newly published materials, it's protected by copyright. Both of us run digitized works through OCR software. In libraries, we do it to create good searchable transcripts but very rarely do we actually go in and correct the OCR. But in our DSOs, the students do need clean and accurate transcripts. So DSO staff are going in and correcting OCR and oftentimes enriching it. This is what I mean when I use the term remediation by adding things like um, alt text for images, for mathematical formulas, for chemistry uh, notation, for uh, tables. They're adding structure, they're adding structured headings, structured tables of contents, and uh, things like that. Now in terms of access, we generally deposit into open access repositories and libraries when we can, but our DSOs uh, have not had that as an option. They've tended to manage access locally on a per user basis, and uh, have even at times, there have been people who've reported feeling that they're afraid that holding onto these files could constitute some sort of legal liability and they delete them at the end of every year. And this is because there is a lot of, there, there are a lot of misconceptions about the law in this space. I think that the best place to go to really 
dispel those misconceptions is a report that came out of the first round of, of the FRAME grant called The Law and Accessible Texts by Brandon Butler, Prue Adler, and Krista Cox. It really gives a great overview of everything that's at play in this area. And they teach us in this report that we have a hierarchy of laws in the, in the United States that really argues in favor of us being able to do this sort of work. So on the first level, there's the First Amendment, which offers wide protections of speech, which tapers down to disability and civil rights law, which vindicates the First Amendment, and then copyright law, which yields to disability and civil rights interests where appropriate. Now, in terms of disability law, we're primarily concerned with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which mandates the elimination of discrimination on the basis of disability, meaning that we're not so much breaking the law when we're doing this work so much as complying with the law. And this is further refined by copyright law such and such uh, things as the Chaffee Amendment, the fair use provision, and the precedent set by the Authors Guild versus Hottie Trust case. When you take it all together, each step in the workflow is protected by the law. When it comes to request, anyone with a disability that inhibits them from using traditional print or electronic formats may request an accessible version. And it turns out that that person doesn't need to buy it. The DSO doesn't need to buy a copy. The library doesn't need to buy a copy. It's a common misconception that someone needs to actually pay for a copy of that edition, but they don't actually have to. Remediation is unproblematic from a copyright standpoint. The Supreme Court has acknowledged that it falls under fair use. Delivery is also unproblematic. So once an accessible copy has been created, it can be delivered to the person who has that need and uh, in whatever format is appropriate to that person's use. We don't need to put any kind of draconian technological protection measures on them like, I don't know, watermarks or digital fingerprinting technology or issuing burn after reading notices. Like none of that is actually required by the law. But when it comes to retaining and sharing these works, we do need to be responsible. So there is a, a line of fair use case law that supports creating a database of in copyright works, as long as it is meant to support legitimate fair use. And that's what Emma is doing. I would emphasize that these texts are not just being published out into the open for everyone to use. The people who can use Emma are people who work for a disability services office, that they're authenticated registered users and they're doing their work on behalf of, uh, of uh, students generally who have a registered print disability with their campus. So a lot of caution has been taken to ensure these aspects. In addition to the US law that I mentioned, the US is also a signatory with 87 other countries to the Marrakesh Treaty, which is an international agreement to make the production and transfer of remediated texts uh, for people with blindness or visual impairments easier by reducing the limitations and establishing certain exceptions to copyright law internationally. So that's a even greener green light for us to be able to do this work and uh, to do it potentially on an international scale. Now, I would emphasize that this work is not necessarily hostile to the publishing industry. It, rather, it seeks to correct a gap in their current model. Publishers who take an accessible first approach to their work tend to be very easy for our DSOs to work with. Um, and it's only because not enough of them do that we have to do this very time consuming, expensive, te at times tedious work of digitization remediation. So really what we're doing is filling a gap in their model by building all, all this infrastructure that we've built for this project. Now, if you join onto this as a member of Emma, now, Emma is, I think the folks at UVA said that they're hoping to roll out a membership model later this year in July, I believe. But if you sign on, your library is going to have to get to know your DSO to build a workflow for depositing texts into the system. And there's gonna have to be a getting to know one another. And I can guarantee that one DSO does things very differently from another across, whoa, sorry, <laughs> across the board at all of our institutions. 
Um, but some of the things that you would have to talk about are things like file formats. What file formats uh, is your DSO creating? Are you creating Braille files, DAISY files, which is a variant of EPUB, Microsoft Word, PDF? This is gonna differ from place to place, but also sometimes from semester to semester based on the needs of particular students and what hardware and software they like to use. We'll have to know how they're keeping track of bibliographic metadata for the items that they're remediating so that when we up, do a, uh, an upload at the end of whenever we do them every semester, we need to know we're getting good metadata. Fortunately, the system has a nice feature that you can use an ISBN to query WorldCat and Google Books and bring in good metadata so we don't have to necessarily rekey everything. But we need to have a workflow in, in place that that uh, can enable us to find that metadata. The system also requires metadata about remediation actions. And this is important in the end user interface when it comes to search because if you can see on some of these little screen grabs, the, the search interface allows you to scope on different accessibility features and, uh, and formats. So if you have a user who has a particular need, you can search by, to, to see whether you can find files that have been remediated that actually already meet those needs. And you have to make certain decisions like, how often is this deposit happening? Is it happening on a rolling basis? Is it occurring at the end of every year? Is it happening at the end of every semester? And who's actually doing the submission? Who's pushing the button? Are there legacy items? Do you, are, is there a hard drive under a desk somewhere with 10 years of work focused on, this, uh, on, on, on doing this that we could build a retrospective project to address. So our workflow that we've established at uh, our library is one where DRES will track the items that they're doing throughout the semester in a spreadsheet by ISBN. They're storing their remediated files in, in a cloud storage shared folder. And at the end of the semester, they're uploading them to Emma utilizing that bibliographic lookup feature. Now we in the library will advise on any met metadata problems that may arise and we're gonna be working with them iteratively over the years to streamline their workflow because the, the workflow tools keep changing and improving from the developers. Um, we hope to get to a place where they can initiate the workflow by starting uh, an upload and we can be, the, the librarians can be the approvers. The system doesn't quite do that yet but I think it might be coming. So if I could summarize, um, the primary use case for Emma is uh, it's meant to be used for DSO officers who can search across multiple repositories to find texts that their students may need. They can follow a download link to the, an item that they discover. If they further remediate a file, they can upload it back to Emma and it'll, that variant version will go back to its home repository. And if they're pre preparing something that does not exist yet in any of those repositories, they can uh, deposit it with good metadata directly into Emma where people at other DSOs can discover it. Membership for Emma is slated to open up in mid 2023. I think the folks at UVA who are coordinating this have said that they're targeting July, but I'm not sure if, if, the, if that's the case. But if you're interested in possibly joining, the email address is emma for accessibility at virginia.edu. They're the people to contact, um, not, not myself. Now, Emma is going to ask for libraries to partner with the disability services offices on their campus in this membership uh, to get, kind of go through the process that I told you about of learning how they do things and work in developing a deposit workflow. But they're not planning to ask libraries to pay for it, at least not first and foremost. They want to target the offices where disability services report, which could be different, very different from one, one institution to another. It could be the office of the provost, uh, vice president, or the office of student affairs. I was talking to someone this morning who said that their DSO is based out of IT. So it, there's gonna be a lot of vari uh, variance here. Um, but membership dues will be used to sustain and develop the Emma service. So if I could 
conclude on a personal note, I would say this project has been very inspiring for me to work on, uh, in part because sometimes I can be kind of critical of how we do things in libraries uh, when it comes to building partnerships or you know, funneling money into certain, I don't know, software projects that might not succeed. But um, being in, in, in a room with people at these, who work in disability services, first of all, they're doing like really phenomenal work, but it's very clear that they just don't have the same type of culture of collaboration and co national coordination that we have in libraries. So in this project, we were really able to bring kind of these librarian superpowers to the table when it comes to all the work we've done over the years in library catalog automation and building repositories and having a very principled understanding of the law. So, uh, you know, with all that taken together, the project has really been inspiring for me and I hope that maybe it will inspire some of you to join on as members as well. So, thank you very much. And I left time for questions. Hi, Kyle. Uh, Hi. Thanks for that uh, great presentation. Um, I've been working as part of the ARL Carl Marrakesh Treaty implementation subs uh, sister project to this one. And it seems like one of the hard parts about this is the um, ensuring that the person, the requester, is actually a legitimate a print disabled person. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in how you folks have uh, thought of that and what your uh, approach is, thanks. Sure, so the approach is for all of this to be mediated through a disability services office. There has been some discussion of whether the system could be opened eventually to registered users, but I think the technical decision that they made and probably political decision that has been made at this point has been uh, that the system is primarily used for people who work on behalf of users with print dis of the print disabled. So th that's, the, that's the approach that they're taking so far on the project, but maybe it, it could end up developing in the direction that you're suggesting, but right now it's not built for that. Hi Kyle, I'm uh, Charles Watkinson. I'm uh, uh, from University of Michigan. But um, I'm asking this question as the president of the Association of University Presses this year. So Emma is an awesome project, and we, you know, I followed it from the beginning. And of course, university presses are contributing through Bookshare, yes. um, born accessible content. But one of the problems we're facing is the 2025 deadline coming in Europe for the um, uh, all ebooks essentially to be published in accessible forms mm -hmm. as we newly market them. And the costs of remediation are very, very substantial for us. <clears throat> Do you see any potential for the remediated copies um, in Emma to potentially be uh, accessible to the university presses who published them originally so as to be able to sort of um, have a feedback loop into what the presses can do, especially if a university press is part of a member library? Well, I guess I'd wonder, are you talking about your backlog of things you've published in the past or things that you're publishing in the future? Because exactly, backlog. Backlog, okay, yeah. I mean, in the future, hopefully, you know, your process is digital and a lot of what you're doing, what we end up in DSOs, people end up doing is kind of recreating some of the work that you've done already in digital typesetting, if you want to call it that. Um, so I, I suppose that that could be uh, something that you could rely on, but I wouldn't say that anyone is going to digitize your entire back catalog for you. So, but that, unless you wanted to set that up as a project with, I don't know, your library and propose to them that that could be a project to tackle. I mean, I could see that being something that you could maybe try to request centralized funds to, to support, perhaps. But, but the, 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 the copies that are already in Emma, yes. so doing a search saying University of Michigan Press, would it be possible for the university press to pull those out and incorporate it in its own products? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what if, if you could pull them out to incorporate in your own products. That would be something that you would probably have to ask maybe some, some of the folks on the administrative side of Emma. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not certain about that, but good question. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, seeing no more questions. Thank you very much for your attention, appreciate it.